We're ready to go to item number two, report on rail in the past, past, present, future impact. Senator Shapley. And you, have you, a, you should have a, a, a handout as well in your packet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a report that I hope everyone gets a copy of and spends some time to read. I want to first thank the, the Policy Board for appointing a committee. Uh, Commissioner Salania Kavanagh served on it. Uh, Susie Bird gave it her all, and she's paid the price for being on this committee. You can see that. Um, there were other members of the committee, the Ever Ready. Uh, Charles Berry was with us on this committee. We had we took a day worth of testimony from a dozen witnesses and then spent six months gathering information on rail in the past. We will see historic issues with rail in the next 10 years and so the choice to our community is to deal with the challenge and have an effective plan or not deal with the challenge. So what we're going to lay out here is two parts of this. The industrial rail piece, what's happening with rail coming into El Paso and in industrial rail, and the history of commuter rail in El Paso Juarez. So with that, I also want to thank George Pinal. He um, wrote a thesis on this in the last six months, and he'll turn it in and get credit for his PhD. So if we could go forward. Next slide. This is a rail map done by a independent outfit called Cambridge that is not linked to the railroads and I think it's real important to get independent information because trying to get the rail companies to give you information is tough. But this is showing traffic per day in freight corridors in the year 2035. And the corridor that we're interested in, the one that is, um, is the key to our discussion, is the one that's coming from Long Beach, you can see it over there in California, that comes along the line, the UP line coming down to El Paso. Stay focused on that line because that's where the action is going to be in the coming years. And what's driving it is traffic from China and India, big, big box traffic to two ports, Long Beach and a port to be built very soon in Baja, California. Next slide. This is what's going to impact us. The Mexican <coughs> government has been planning for several years and just put out to bid a new port called Punta Colonet. And Punta Colonet is a design build port that is not only the port but the rail connection up to the border coming to the UP line going across from uh, California to El Paso. And when they are done with this port, it will be two thirds the size of Long Beach. They're building a 10 million container port. When we talk about containers, we're talking about the, um, the shipping containers. That's how port traffic is measured. Just to give you a context, Long Beach is about 15 million, and this is going to end up being 10 million when it's done. This is the current rail infrastructure in El Paso and Juarez. If you look around, these different lines connect us. Those are the different yards that, that uh, they come in and do different intermodal pieces and, and provide fueling stations. Those, is, if you look at the bottom right, you'll see the ownership of those lines. The line coming up from the south is owned by Fedomex. BNSF owns the red line and the blue line is owned by UP. UP is the one that was here um, a week ago to tell us what their plans were. Now this is the key slide because this is the one that we need to stay focused on. If you count the increase in volume that's coming from Long Beach, Remember, Long Beach is the biggest port on the West Coast. You take the shipping containers that are going to come through Punta Colonet, all of that will soon impact El Paso, Juarez, Southern New Mexico. So the question is, what is our plan to deal with this rail traffic? It's very important to remember, not hardly any of this is going through value added here. In other words, a few trains a day will stop here and pick up freight, but the vast majority are impact trains. They're going to impact at-grade crossings. They're going to impact transportation. They're going to impact congestion and pollution. And the pollution is the lines of cars waiting to cross in central El Paso and primarily the valley. So let's take a look. This, these are projections only to 2016. These are not projections to 2035. If we take the projections to 2035, you'll see significant impact in those out years because of what happens in Punto Colonet. 
So if you look at the line, remember the one we were talking about coming in from the west coast from Long Beach, the key line that goes through Sunland Park, that comes through central El Paso. For those of you that go to City Hall every day and look at the trains, this is your line. There are about 30 to 47 trains a day moving through there today. There'll be 85 trains per day in 2016 and 150 trains a day by 2035. That's what's coming. And if you look at where they're going to get split up and where they'll end up going, you can see that some of those will end up on the line to Tucumcari. Some come down on the line that goes into the valley. The valley line splits. One goes to Dallas and one goes to Houston. It's safe to say this is the rail pass for the southern United States. And all of this traffic of both Mexico and the United States is going to be on this line. So the challenge is, what do you want to do about it? Let's talk about Mexico. This is the current alignment of rail in Mexico. These are the crossings that provide significant congestion problems in Mexico. This is the Federal Mex line coming up from Samalayuca. It's safe to say that for 100 years, the municipal government of Juarez has said, we need to do something about this line because when these trains are stopped in central Juarez, it stops any traffic from moving there. Those of you who are around in El Paso's history in the 1920s and 30s remember the rail lines in downtown El Paso. Uh, Mr. Rooney, we're talking to you at this point. Um, I'm, I'm highlighting your excellent the, um, the, the issue in downtown El Paso was you had these trains stopped and you couldn't move in downtown, so what did they do? They trenched it under the bank building in something called the Baton Trenchway. That was the first major trenching in the United States, and it provided for free movement. And the train right now goes under the bank building in El Paso. That was done in 1959. That model was used in, um, in Los Angeles in something called the Alameda Corridor later on because trenching provided a very uh, good way of providing at-grade traffic on the surface but moved the trains through downtown highly congested areas. So this issue in Juarez has been on their front burner for a long time. If you look back in the press accounts going back at least into the 40s, they've been talking about what do we do about the freight lines in Juarez because they have to stop for a customs check. And when they stop, they sit there and it causes hours of congestion. This is the most important infrastructure piece to stay focused on. If you look right there to the left, that's the Black Bridge. This is what provides crossing into the United States. It will soon be one of the most valuable uh, crossings because what's about to happen with the movement of rail. So that black bridge will be something that we need to stay focused on because that is how rail crosses from Mexico into the United States. Now what is currently being planned? Uh, Commissioner Saldana Cavanis has been involved in this. The whole state of New Mexico has made this a priority. Uh, when we talk to our friends in New Mexico like Alvin Dominguez, he's been working on this. Governor Richardson has made this a top priority of his administration. He and Governor Baeza have worked on this nonstop for four years. Basically, what they've been planning and what is now in the final stages is to move the rail, move the rail out of downtown Juarez and move it over to the west. So the Samarayuca line, the line that's coming up from Chihuahua City, the Fedomex line moves. It comes over here. The crossing is not exactly clear where that will occur. It got a hook up with both the UP and the BNSF line, and the acquisition for real estate is already happening on that side of New Mexico. And this has been a top priority for both the uh, counties in this area and the state government of New Mexico. There's a few hurdles here. There's a couple of things they're still talking about, but when you're starting to buy right of way, you can be pretty sure that this thing's going to happen. So what does that do? That frees up this line, which has been the center of commerce for over 100 years, from the 1880s, it's going to free it up in downtown Juarez, downtown El Paso, on the west side here. This will become a line that will not have the traffic that it's had before, and in my view becomes a very important infrastructure opportunity. Next slide. Now let's look at our transit pass. Let's switch from commercial industrial rail, what's hauling the big stuff, to what's happened here in the past. You'll, you'll see that right there. That's a Democratic mule on the right side hauling a heavy load, bringing people back and forth to make sure that transit happens in El Paso. This picture is taken right at the turn of the century in downtown El Paso. You can see O.T. Bassett Lumber Company in the background. 
This is a, a scene from downtown El Paso. This is Mexican streetcar terminal of trolleys, electrified trolleys going into Mexico at the turn of the century. If you look here, that's a familiar landmark. Remember, you had trolleys taking passengers right off the train into downtown as far as the Sleta. This is a trolley, electrified trolley coming across the border at the old version of one of the international bridges. And this, of course, you'll recognize this, um, uh, Roy, because this is a retirement party for Mandy the Mule <laughs> right here. Mandy the Mule, after 35 years of service, faithful service, she's in that little cart. She's being retired and honored. I think she got a gold watch that day. It was a big day in El Paso Transit history. <clears throat> now, let's talk a little bit about the history of what happened here in railway cars, because this is a history, in my view, a proud history of El Paso. In 1881, you had Anson Mills and Joseph McGoffin, a name familiar to Joe Pickett, built six mule-drawn street railway cars, one connecting Stratton Street to Avenida Lerdo in, in Ciudad Juarez. In 1901, the El Paso Electric Railway Company purchased the railway system. That, in fact, was the beginning of the electric company, was that they were the transit energy source in El Paso, Texas. You had 1902, the first electric trolley left for Juarez. More than 100 years of electrified light rail in El Paso, Texas, Juarez, one of the legacies of a great international town. And then you had in 1907, you've had a 35 mile long international system in El Paso, Texas by 1907. This is the map from the city plan of 1925. If you look in red, those are the railway tracks that existed and the trolley tracks. You had the most used line, Chente, the most trafficked line was the one going from downtown to Isleta because that's where people wanted to use low cost transit to get into town to do their shopping, to do the stuff that they needed to do and then go back into the valley. That was our past, that's where we were in 1925. Fast forward. What happens? Mm -hmm. What happens, mm -hmm. let's go back here. Can we go to the next slide? And they were, they were what happens is a part of transit history that is, is not very well known but is very important. By the 1940s, Standard Oil and General Motors are putting together a consortium to replace the old fashioned streetcars with new modern buses. And this consortium, um, by that time, nearly every single North American city had a tramway or a trolley system or a light rail system. By 1970, this was reduced to about a dozen because this consortium, Mr. Rooney, bought up the rail lines, bought up the trolley systems, and tore them up and set the stage for 50 years of what then became the growth of the automobile, highways, and suburbs in America. 1943, they purchased the transit division of the El Paso Electric Company and shut down most of what was a very vibrant international trolley system. By then, there was only 3.2 miles of international car line across the border to Juarez. In 1974, the last year of operation of the trolley line, 13,000 people used that line. So the demand for international light rail in 1974 was 13,000 people crossing that line. And what happened in 1974 is that line was shut down. And there's a big, there's an account of this, an historical account you can go get in the library. There's a lot of politics, primarily in Juarez, but uh, Juarez taxi cab drivers and shop owners had a lot to do to say, let's shut down this line. And that's the history of what happened in light rail in El Paso. We had it 100 years ago. Next slide. Since then, there have been multiple efforts to talk about what to do about crossing the border and making it a very effective international transit system. These are the studies. Bernard Johnson submitted a study for $7.8 million for a 22-mile streetcar system in 1981. In 1993, Kimberly Horn prepared a study recommending a half-mile streetcar line at San Jacinto Plaza and Oregon Street. That half-mile was projected to have 6,000 passengers a day. That was in 93. In 95, this was the Francis administration. The city budgeted $13.5 million for a streetcar from the plaza to the Santa Fe Bridge. And then in the Caballero administration, this board approved and commissioned a very uh, uh, ambitious study to look at the larger picture of what do you do about industrial rail and what do you do about light rail. And this was an effective 
schematic that showed what would happen in the future if we pursued uh, the plan of relocating the rail and then reusing the central piece of this dedicated to transit rail. Regardless, there are two issues facing us. One is, what do you want to do about the industrial rail that's coming our way that will have an enormous effect on quality of life? And what do we as a board and a community want to do about the opportunity of that 40 miles central rail system that's going to be soon to be abandoned in Juarez and um, parts of El Paso. Uh, these are the elements of the Caballero plan. Relocate the east-west UP line from Strauss, New Mexico to East El Paso. Uh, build new state-of-the-art rail yards. Build <coughs> major international intermodal facility at EPIA and relocate the Mexican line from downtown El Paso to Juarez and Santa Teresa. Guess what? New Mexico saw this plan, loved it, and just went and did it. They did their part of the plan, but our side, the El Paso side, has not been effectively approved and we haven't laid out the plan of what we're going to do and what we think is the most appropriate use of our resources and money. This is the percentage of rail commodity coming in by type for the El Paso MPO area. It shows you the breakdown of what's moving through here and what can affect us in the future. Now, when you heard the UP guy tell us, well, how much of this is hazmat, he said, well, Nearly all of it's hazmat, but detergents in the store could be classified as hazmat. We're trying to get a breakdown of what's coming through here from L.A. to Houston to understand what risks these lines present. And that's one of the calculations that we have to have as we think about the future is what do you want to do about hazmat and what might be coming in these rail lines. This is the number of at-grade crossings in El Paso, Texas. There's 200 Chente at grade crossings. So if you measured the impact of what's going to happen when this line comes and 130 trains a day are rolling through here in 2030, I want you to look at central El Paso. And I want you to look at the valley. Because that's where the impact is going to be felt most keenly. If you've ever been waiting uh, at Montana Street or some of those streets when that train goes through on the Tucumcari line, or if you're down there at Saragossa and Isleta and having those trains come through at grade crossings, or if you're down in that part of the valley where, um, where you see one after another of these at grade crossings, then the question is, if you've got a train coming through once every eight minutes, what do you want to do? What do you want to do about that end of uh, the valley and what do we want to do as a community about this challenge that's being presented to us? Um, this was the essence of the um, linking up in a transit-related development concept, the key installations in El Paso, Texas, and southern New Mexico. So the challenge we have is how do we take and line up these key population centers and get them on transit-related development lines, including Sunland, New Mexico, and the casino, and Las Cruces. That's the challenge ahead. Those lines, everything you see there is on a railroad line or close to it. Next slide. Let's look at what other communities have done. Uh, Mr. Cole to meet this challenge. The day he was elected, Bill Richardson set out the most bold initiative on commuter rail in the country. And he took a little used class four rail line and converted 85 miles of it into light rail in three years. Now critics stand up and say the cost is terrible. You know what the cost was per mile? Three million dollars. It was three million dollars which is half the cost of building a highway system. Why was it so cheap? Because he used existing class four rail. He did a deal with UP and said, how can we um, get access to your rail lines? Where are you gonna put your commercial traffic? And how can we have a deal that benefits the whole region? This is done and in existence. And if you've been up to Albuquerque, this is what it looks like today. That's not virtual reality, that's a photograph of one of these sites where passengers are currently using New Mexico's rail runner system, which is the fastest on-time project in United States commuter rail history. Three million a mile, 85 miles. What was the key? Existing class four rail. You didn't have to build the infrastructure, it was there. You already had the train depots in place, all you had to do was refit them. That's existing right now? That is existing in Albuquerque today. If you go to Albuquerque, Chente, uh, they have the Chente Quintanilla room up on the top there. <laughs> you can get up there and ride that straight up to from southern Bernalillo County all the way up to the north 
And now they're building the second phase of it to connect up to Santa Fe, and that is more expensive because they, aren't, they don't have the existing rail and they're having to lay the rail down. They're having to build the underpasses. They're having to do the things that make it more expensive. But the use of existing rail makes it a very inexpensive proposition. Next slide. <coughs> Cost of track per mile, 2.8 million. 100 miles of commuter rail within four years. Bought 270 miles from BNSF. 1.2 million riders. It, it was 10 times what they thought would use it when they started using it. And you have <coughs> class four track for $75 million. So the key to that was acquiring existing trackage. Next slide. Austin, Texas, Metro Rail. This is Austin's proposed light rail system, which is in stages of development. They're taking 32 miles of existing freight track. They have already developed the uh, sites where the passengers are going to deploy. They're going to start, I think, this year in terms of actual ridership. And future connections are being studied. I'll tell you the difference between Austin and Albuquerque was Bill Richardson. He just said, we're going to get it done. He went and got it done. It was done in three years. In Austin, they study things into perpetuity. <coughs> Downtown tra downtowns across the United States. In the United States, 40 cities are exploring uh, trolley cars, street cars, or light rail to spur economic development and provide transit. What is the key driver? The key driver is $7 gas. $7 gas, which is the projected price of gas in 2011. We're now in a period where gas dropped from up near four to 260, but what's driving the cost of gas is China and India. And when you have a middle class being built there of a million cars every year, and they're, they're making cars now at $2,000 a piece in India, the question is, what is gonna be the availability of oil as we go forward? And if you talk to anyone that's studying this thing, you're looking at $7 gas sometime in 2011. So other cities, it's really important to note, are having these very plans put out because why? <coughs> when you had gas up at four, 40% switched to transit. People voted with their feet and they said, I can't afford my car, I can't be in my car, <coughs> I can't drive from Socorro to downtown and back and use up a gallon, I mean, a, two tanks a week, when it's costing me $125 to fill up my tank, and they made the vote with their feet to look at a cheaper, better alternative. That's exactly what's happening. So the question is, what do you want to do about it in this community? Um, this is what I believe to be the best transit-related development in Texas. I'd ask that you go take a trip if you can. That is Las Colinas, right in the heart of Dallas. Mm -hmm. I went there about two weeks ago. There at the bottom, you have Dallas Area Rapid Transit. Let me see if I can locate this. This is the best uh, light rail system in Texas that's currently being developed. It runs right through here uh, and out this way. This is a man-made lake that was an old swamp. It's like downtown El Paso after a big rainstorm. The downtown cotton area was the bosque of the region in the 1700s, and that's why it continues to flood. And what they're doing here is they're running transit-related development right here. They have a people mover that just goes between buildings. It's like being in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. There's not a human being piloting it. It goes every 10 minutes. It links all of these buildings. And the result of this is they've attracted 30 Fortune 500 companies into this little 200-acre spot, and they have $7 billion of construction projects online right there because of what they've created in transit-related development. People want to be where they can move at low cost and with secure transit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the recommendation of our committee is two, and this is what we're going to ask for a vote on and approval. One, we believe there's an opportunity with respect to that 40-mile central rail, El Paso Juarez, to open negotiations with the city at Municipio de Juarez and talk about what might be the use. The realistic time frame is it's probably four to five years before that rail will actually be totally moved. I think uh, uh, Commissioner Salania Kavnis probably has current news on that, and uh, Alvin probably can tell us the date for that, but it's going to happen. So what ought to be the reuse function of that line? I think the city of El Paso is having discussions right now. I think we ought to support that to say what would be the reuse function, and let's get into that because it's a 100-year opportunity. The second recommendation of this committee is to take the moffitt Nichols study and update it. What are we going to do about the challenge that we face of 130 trains a day coming through here? What's the best use of public money? 
do we trench and deal with the congestion issues on the ground, or, we, or do we do the relocation plan with the reuse function? What's the best way to approach it? I think that's a huge challenge ahead that we're going to need more information on. So those are the two recommendations of our committee. It's been a great honor. In addition to getting $600 a month from the State Senate, this one was zero a month to let's, do this great, great let's, work. Let's do the, the, the whole picture. It's 600 gross. Yeah. <laughs> the net is health a lot, insurance. The, the net is a lot less. Um, Senator, on your two recommendations, the first one probably is something that we could take at this point. The second recommendation probably uh, just, again, because the processes should probably go to TPAC, let them fare through it. And, and we need a champion, meaning it probably um, needs to come from the city of El Paso to update the study, because I know the city had just um, finished another one. But if, if you wouldn't mind, if, um, and, and it looks like we're having some discussion, but um, supporting the city on taking a look at that, I, I think that is a no-brainer. Let, let me just lay out a couple of time concerns, and I think the city and the county are both aware of this. The earmarks for major transportation funds are being prepared right now to be put in the reauthorization bill and the requests are being made from the congressmen and the U.S. Senators, what are we going to do in El Paso? And the whole issue of rail relocation, whether we're going to trench, relocate, they are going to need to earmark with some degree of specificity. So I would ask that whatever we do, we add a little bit of urgency to it so we can give the congressmen, our senators, and I'm including New Mexico on this, some direction about where do we want to go with earmark funding for rail relocation because this is going to be a big, big issue coming up, and we're talking about a lot of money to get earmarked. So that's we, my only concern. We also have a city council member here. I mean, this, this, we kind of need a recommendation coming from the city of El Paso. Um, we have not formally taken this up as an issue. Um, I do know that the, the mayor has been in conversation with uh, Mayor Fetis in Juarez about the existing rail line and what the opportunities are to connect our region um, through transit. You know, the mode, how to, how to do that, and, you know, it's just been kind of an open-ended conversation. Um, and then on, in terms of the Moffat Nichols study and the follow-up, um, we actually did not take a f make a formal recommendation. We, there was a co some conversation at the end of that. I, I, I believe that the, that would need to be taken to the Transportation Legislative Review Committee and then to the to the council as a whole. And um, you know, I think there would be some willingness to look at it. There's been a lot of concern about um, the impact of just current rail operations in neighborhoods, whether it's part of in the medical center of the Americas, the quiet zone issues. Um, uh, and, and so I, th I think there is a willingness to take that up. I don't know that we could at this point um, put resources towards it. We, you know, we're kind of tapped out in terms of our debt authorization. So um, Pat might need to, uh, what, what did, how much was the Moffitt Nichols, the, the follow-up report estimated at? The phase one was $680,000 and it had been programmed initially for a million dollar project. So it would have been another quarter million dollars for okay. phase two. For phase two. And w is there any existing allocation for the no, remainder no. of that? Okay. Joe, I don't, we don't have a problem. I think this needs to go through the, the tech process to make sure we have a best decision, but we're going to need a champion to move it forward, whether it's TxDOT or, but this, this is a major issue that's going to need a lot of moving parts, and I, I think that's a good idea, but our view is let's move it to some place where we're going to get some recommendations put on the table because as the earmark process moves through, we don't want to be left out of the seven-year cycle of what's going to happen in Washington, right. D.C. So. Uh, that's my concern is that we have a, an orderly process to come up with a regional recommendation so we have a pretty good idea of what the whole big picture is going to look like and it's going to need some study. Okay, may I, How about sure. the mobility authority do they produce any tool? No. No? This no. Really, what, 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 we, what really needs to happen is, uh, you, you said it, was find a champion and right now the champion uh, really needs to be the city of El Paso. So we need to find out if the city is willing to be the champion, if they're not, I don't know that there is a lot of other um, avenues other than the county because obviously that covers the in, entire area. I would still recommend at this point we send it to TPAC and let them 
vet this out and let us find out if the city can be a champion. We need to get some, some costs. <coughs> I agree that we need to get some numbers because there's a lot of conflicting things out there. Earlier this year, remember, we had a, a report done by the Ta Texas Transportation Institute on uh, rail and where they believed it was going to come and, and they actually believed Punta Colonet wasn't going to happen. That's their data. And well, the that, data that's in yeah. there is what they gave to us, so it's a little different. Yeah, from what that, that, that's us. why we need to have somebody take a, a, an objective look at this because they believe that it's going to shift further and that the north south, or actually the north, is going to skip over us, even the stuff coming from Long Beach, and it's going to come up through uh, Laredo area just because of the uh, ports there are usually built private and the private doesn't look like they want to build it where they originally planning. I mean, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, that was just well, we had an hour long briefing from them and there's a lot of activity and there's a chart in here on the Mexican port, Lazaro Cardenas, which is the biggest port on the West Coast, is going to be seeing a 25% increase and that will go through Laredo. But Punto Colonet has to come on this line because of Sierra Madres. So it'll be connected up near Yuma. That's where they're going to get. And so we will get the impact of Lazaro Cardenas. And so that that is I don't think that's in dispute how much is moved from Long Beach down that's a question because they're competing with Long Beach and how much is new traffic is uh, an issue people are still forecasting that but I think the point is that when UP is double tracking and double stacking the whole route from the west coast to here and willing to put in their investment you know they're looking at something in the future so well, let's, I think what we need to go is let's get a plan here. Well, let's let's get it to, to TPAC. Let's get it to TPAC for a recommendation because all the players are a part of that, and we can find out whether or not. And it still may go back to the city. I mean, the the recommendation from TPAC may be to formally take it to city council and say, "Are you willing to be champions or not?" That may be the first level. And if that's the case, then we know who the champion is. If it's not, then we need a plan B. Let me, let me just interject this little piece of information. We're not the only city in this, where we are with rail. When you look at the rail and it splits to Dallas, they're having this discussion. When it splits to go to Houston, they're having this discussion. Rail relocation is a hot topic in Texas. And so we're going to do something this session on funding pieces of this. So I'm quite confident that we could get TxDOT to be a strong partner, if not a champion, on some of this in the future. But I think going through the TAC is really a better idea, and maybe we ought to do that. Yes, Representative. We'll, what we'll do is we'll put it in front of the, the, the Moffitt Nichols study had three or four kind of short term recommendations. We'll put those recommendations in front of the Transportation Legislative Review Committee as well as what additional work needs to be done in order to complete that study. Um, I, I think one of the things, that, f from my memory of the study, I haven't read it in a while, that um, is really important is is really understanding what leverage we have in regards to the to the to the railroads if you look at the Alameda corridor and what happened in Los Angeles the reason they were able to do that is that the railroads did not have the capa the, the 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 capacity or the right of way that they needed to actually make that work for the projected volumes um, and so they were the, the at that point the, the the railroads were uniquely motivated to participate and cooperate, um, and we have not enjoyed that type of unique motivation in this community. So I think one of the things that we need to do um, as a body and as as just find out where our leverage points might be. It might be the hazmat issue. It might be some some um, some of the issues related to the capacity in the region. Um, and then in terms of the. Um, so we'll we'll put that in front of them, and we'll work with Sylvia to make sure okay. that the pieces that we need going forward get but we'll placed still, on we'll, authorization. We'll still we need to go ahead and pass on a TPAC anyway to let them make some further recommendations, Sorry. and that doesn't mean a one-time thing. I mean, you could go Sorry. to TPAC, and at the time, you know, a snapshot. This is what they think, but we still need to hear back from the city. And whether TPAC does or not at the first discussion level doesn't mean they won't do it at a subsequent one. Because I think this is a lot of work that's been done. I think that there's a lot of answers to these questions that we need to have. And, and, and Senator, this is pretty detailed. Um, you mentioned Joseph McGoffin, not that I'm not related to Joseph McGoffin, maybe it was a Joseph, but my family uh, was part of the El Paso uh, Electric 
trolley company and subsequently El Paso Electric that uh, got bought out. I don't have any stock. I just want you to know that. But I, can I make one, one other <laughs> final point? Yes. The, the, the volumes that were projected from the consultant, I think this is really important. Their, their, their understanding and what they communicated to us was that regardless of what happens with Punta Colonet, if Punta Colonet comes online, the volumes are the same. We're, what their message to us was you're going to see a lot more volume for east -west. Th than, you, right. than you've seen. In the, and what we might want to do in anticipation of that is understand the maybe air modeling and congestion modeling and how that's going to impact our region because maybe that, that gives us maybe the leverage we need or the, the tools that we need to really go make a strong case for um, mitigation in the region and under the same process you know as we do with regular roadways you know you, you always look at the no build concept that TxDOT um, talks about it and no build is really kind of the worst case scenario because uh, I, I believe the senator mentioned there was 200 at grade crossings um, but I think we need to look at that too what could come out of this is that uh, we find some things that we could have been doing or can do regardless of what happens with those at grade crossings anyway and we need to uh, look at the alternatives uh, I know ultimately if we could move the railroad line out of the middle of town would be the optimum I mean if we could just do whatever had a checkbook with unlimited funds that would be my first choice just move it around El Paso um, that causes problems for areas like Horizon City and their growth um, because of the at grade crossings and now you know the fact that if you close or if you cross you have to close too. you know it's two for once so every time we build um, and improve where there is a railroad line it causes us a problem so as long as the line stays as it is senator and we continue to cross over that it causes us more problems too with the existing line because every time right. we cross one we've got to close two and that, that's getting harder and harder to find those right. to do. And then the, the other thing that we asked for UP from UP and they have not provided us with yet is which I think would be very valuable is that they're the, in anticipation of the new volumes they're going they're putting more dollar in here more dollars in the region um, to accommodate that and so if we understand how much they're already going to build and maybe understand what the gaps were it, it, between what the public benefit you know if we want to you know put something depress a rail or, or maybe we could be a gap financer to, to get us to a better um, outcome and we can so. we can attempt obviously they don't like to give up that information but right. if you're saying that um, we might help with the cost in a general sense yeah that gets them maybe to open up some of their right. information that they might not have because right. we know the city has got about uh, how much four hundred thousand that we just saved them a few minutes ago <laughs> so <laughs> we let every let everybody know that we've already got about four hundred thousand dollars that they saved just minutes ago that they have in their hot little hands in their checkbook so uh, if you don't mind senator we're going to go ahead and send this to TPAC, would well, you like, like a resolution on the first part of it? On the first, get a resolution to say support the city to enter into negotiations with respect to the FedMex BNSF line, and second, refer the study issue to the TAC for more elaboration and recommendation. I will accept that as a motion. I'll, I'll, I'll second. We have uh, we have uh, several seconds. Uh, Mr. Rooney, you raise your hand. Would you like to make a comment yes. before we vote? Senator Shapley, thanks for the recognition, and I was paying attention. Paid attention to the other meetings I went to. Uh, <coughs> we passed a comprehensive mobility plan. I think Mr. Hahn has got those marketing studies and he has to see if we can come up with $900 million. And I guess where I've I've complete I always get lost is in the strategic fo uh, focus of this or direction. We have the commercial rail part. And for El Paso, there's a north-south line between Mexico and the U.S., then we have the east-west line, and then we throw in the light rail. And either way we do this, it seems like it's, go uh, it's going to be a lot of money. Now, this might be a... Uh, I would identify the comprehensive mobility plan as phase one. I would look at this portion as phase two or part two 
Now, helping Santa Teresa, there's always been this excellent spirit of cooperation. That's how you got that comprehensive plan. Now, if it's strategically to our benefit to help Santa Teresa, and I keep hearing Governor Richardson's name put out, one of our strategic projects seems to be the Northeast Parkway. And so if you put both of those projects together, uh, could we come up with the funding uh, for it? Now, one of Mr. Gilliard's, I noticed on one of the maps, you have the Anthony Gap. Uh, uh, reason I, uh, that gets a rail project, a road project done, but you still got the traffic going east and west that we've got to live with. Uh, one of the maps showed, I guess there's a web gap, that must be the gap north of uh, uh, Anthony Gap, and one of your concerns is you've never had a chance to really look at the grade. And so, you know, it just seems like what's our strategic focus? I, apparently, I know Senator Shapley and some of you are very passionate about it. Uh, I, I guess there's some timelines for federal money that you, and the legislative money you have to get in, but uh, I, would it be possible with the New Mexico folks if we help them on their project? And I don't know what the costs are. When I was going through this, and that's when you, I apparently caught your attention, I saw all these nice dollar costs, but there's no total at the bottom. I think they have rail and, and uh, truck, uh, truck, but it just seems like and I've never been able to see the strategic focus. I've seen advantages of moving uh, the stuff out of downtown, but you still got the folks in the lower valley. And then do, uh, do, is it better to link it? Do we have a better bonding uh, capacity if we work with the state of New Mexico? And I guess you could bring in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned the west uh, relocation of the, of the railroad west of Price. The point there is about 40 miles. Is that dollar already Can you in place to? from Ferromex or from the Mexican government to make that happen, or where is that at? Well, because that's very critical for this. I, I think where we are is we're going to have to get to a option A or option B in this body, and we need a lot more information. So. We're either going to do rail relocation, which has a real clean, wonderful feel because you've relocated, you've got a reuse function, there's a lot of ways to finance that. Drainage money is one of them, but it's costly. Or we deal with at-grade crossings and try and work the infrastructure where we minimize the cost of congestion and pollution. That's where we're headed. And when you look, that's the, that's the big picture plan that Caballero went back in 2002 to Mexico City, I went with them, we went to UP, we went to BNSF, people were all very excited about it, but they said, you pay for it. That's always the issue. <laughs> that's, that's always the issue. So the yeah. alignment from Samalayuca to the east, which is our crossing, is very important because we want rail infrastructure into Mexico, that's one of the issues. And then where exactly you go up to the escarpment and the grade becomes an issue. And then how do you get through the Anthony Gap and connect up with BNSF and UP on the other side is an issue. Here's the point. New Mexico's launched. They're doing the movement of the Juarez Rail to their side. They're establishing where those intermodals are going to be, which will affect where we're going to do ours. And so we have to accelerate on our side some decisions. On our side, we have to make uh, where are we going with this? Are we going to relocate? Are we going to trench? And then we got to get the information to the congressman because he's going to be sitting there saying, what are the earmarks and how do I be specific enough to put this into the earmarks? So we've got to get some information on the table. But I guess I'm saying the Mexican side, yes, sir. Of the Teresa, to the connectivity you know, for the western. Where's it going to connect? Western circle around the city of Juarez. Is it funded? Is oh, it funded? Um, because the last I, I, time we I, met, I think the, and you might help me here, Alvin and, and Dolores, the Mexican side moving the rail is an issue and what it's going to cost them. I think the last number on that on the Mexican side was 42 or something. I don't recall the exact number, but uh, I, know, I know Governor Richardson's office has been meeting directly with, with uh, and, Governor Chihuahua. And not just him, but Calderon is actively involved in it. And they'll get, and I mean, the word to us is that they're going to pay for that to get that done, and I think they've already got the money in the bank on the 
on the New Mexico side to do their very short connective piece. There are some issues there about exactly how the intermodal is going to work out and what piece of land that's going to be, but in terms of paying for it, I, I think that's pretty much agreed to on the Mexican side and the U.S. side. What happens if it doesn't? Some of what the, I, I believe what the Senator is saying, if it does happen and he feels that it is, then we should be there ready to negotiate in case this becomes available, which, you know, that, that that's fine. I mean, but again, it's yet to be show me the money. I mean, this is uh, the, the costs are, are, are a lot. And yeah. using an existing line like they did in Albuquerque is one thing. If we're to relocate, that's not utilizing something in the future on existing lines. To relocate, that's where it gets tough. But and How close are we working with uh, Congressman uh, Sal over there, I mean, Reyes and uh, I think Cito the Congressman. Maybe, you know, it's time that we get a little pork barrel down here. And, uh, well, this would, this, this this would be more you know, than a pork it, it barrel. Is a, it this, is a project. This would be like a vat. Well, I, I got... It would be a vat, not a barrel. Kennedy got it for Boston. Why can't we get it for us? I think the answer is that they're waiting to hear what do you want to do. And so I well, think they're yeah, waiting I mean, for specific language Elvin. on an earmark. Elvin. I think that's what the... What better times than now that, yeah. you know, that we, we got Obama in there and uh, friendly... Probably go went to West Texas or to our, our part of the country. So you're saying Obamanos? Vamonos. 